beautifuls, welcome back to my Chanel. My goodness, do I have a story for you today, my loves. So, this video was meant to be out about a month ago, but unfortunately, due to the hateful people at Endemol constantly worldwide blocking this video, even though it's perfectly legal under fair use law, unfortunately, I have had to kind of scrap this video. So today, I am remaking it as a kind of recap video. Yay! <laughs> This is the first time I'm ever doing like a serious recap kind of episode of a show or show of an episode, should I say? First of all, can we say this show absolutely shocking, absolutely unhinged, and I think that is the exact reason why Endemol do not want it to be public. So I'm gonna try my absolute best to get this content out to you because the world needs to see this show and also get the opinions of an actual transsexual woman on it. Okay, so shall we dive right in, my loves? We start today's episode in the gorgeous Hacienda that's very 2000s decor. We are reminded not only do they get to spend seven nights on a luxury yacht with Miriam as the prize winner, they actually also win £10,000. Now, that's, as I've said before, I feel like that is also an incentive to not blow the cover on Miriam's true identity, as the producers of this show will have us believe. This a is money. not a simple decision made by a woman towards a man. Yes. The center of our love battle holds a secret that our heroic guys have no idea about. Lovely, isn't that lovely? No idea, heroic guys have no idea about as if they're adventuring into new unseen territory, girls. <sighs> Are you taking the pace? And then they used that clip of Miriam saying she was actually born a man in order to solidify that fact. You know my opinion on that part already. I have said she was not born a man. No one of the male species of the human race is born a man. They are born a baby that then goes through puberty to become a man. Then there is a section that explains that Miriam will be going on to reveal her big secret at the finale, which is actually the next episode. And I'm certainly hoping that I don't have to battle with quite the amount of copyright that I've had to for this one, because that would spoil it. Well, that was quite the non-binary fuss. I want us all to see that episode together. But also, can I just say, I really looked really good when I filmed this one. Oh, so annoying. How dare Endemol spoil it? You horrible, horrible girl. We're then shown a clip again of Miriam and Oh God, what's his name? Is it Tom the lifeguard? Tom the lifeguard, when they had like a mud massage and we get another shot up Miriam's towel being like, oh, do they know the secret? Have they clocked out the pageant? And then they play the segment again, which shows the guys, I believe it was in episode one, discussing what it's like to look out for a trans woman when dating. I'm sorry, I've just beaten you by saying, look out for Adam's apples and big hands. Well, sis. Do you see? No. Then I cannot believe this. Then they actually play this clip here of Miriam's skirt. But the four remaining seem to be oblivious to the fact that there is more to Miriam than meets the eye. I, I was fully gagged when I saw that. Fully, fully gagged because how on earth would you have someone go on TV and do that? Like, I, I just, I struggle to see how any cis woman would ever go on television on a dating show and do that. And I also kind of feel like, at what point was the show kind of saying to Miriam, go on, stand on the beach, undo your skirt girls. Let's, let's all have a peep. Stop it. This is probably one of the only real times in this show that I'm genuinely confused about how Miriam agreed to do something like that, because that, to me, would have sent up alarm bells immediately. If I was on a dating show and they, they were like, right, we're gonna get you to stand here now and you're gonna unzip your skirt seductively. I'd be like, Oh, right, okay, so that's what this is. This isn't a dating show. This is like some sort of weird fetish situation. So then Miriam goes on to explain why she hasn't had bottom surgery. Now, bottom surgery is kind of like a, I was gonna say a colloquial term. That's not quite the word. It's a slang term for having a GCS, known as gender confirmation surgery, or SRS, as it used to be known as sexual reassignment surgery. And she goes on to explain that people have come up to her and asked her, why are you half and half? A, it's none of their business, sis, but also it's one of those things that it's very individual to each person's journey. I think a lot of cis people assume that transition looks from one type to the other. Like you go along this entire journey and that's it, done. But 
actually transition looks different for every trans person that there is. I've said this a few times, but I'm going to say it again. I call myself a transsexual woman because it's very easy to understand from that label exactly what's happening. I started at one point and I'm planning on ending at another. And there is no variation within that. I am still within the gender binary, unlike some of my trans siblings who are not in the gender binary. I know a lot of people aren't a fan of labels and categories. I'm not in terms of like how to treat people from those categories, but I, I do like a little bit of a label because I feel like it kind of makes me a little bit easier to understand if you know what I mean. Miriam then goes on to explain that you never really know if the bottom surgery is gonna go to plan. You never really know quite if it's going to be 100% for you. And also you shouldn't get it to please anyone else but yourself. And I cannot agree more with Miriam's sentiment here. It's also, I wish she kind of had a mention, maybe she did and they cut it out. It's actually a very expensive surgery to get. And not only that, there are only a handful of very, very good surgeons in the world. And as we are developing in time, you know, it's now 2022, some of those have actually retired from doing surgeries. So it's one of those things where it's an individual, it's up to an individual. It really is up to an individual. I feel like the only real reason you would ever need to disclose your surgery status is when you are dating. And that is where I kind of feel like this show has not been uh, an informed consent environmentally friendly place for really anyone involved actually. The guys haven't been given informed consent so that Miriam can feel safe and that they can feel safe because if they had of, imagine how good this dating show would have been if it was actually about exploring trans relationships or cis and trans relationships in, from a trans person's point of view. Imagine, that would have been so good. Unfortunately, it's not like that, and it's all for this big reveal moment and the fight at the end. In the next segment, we see talking heads from the guys explaining what they like about Miriam and what her best feature is. This has been edited in such a way that kind of makes them want to, or it makes us as the audience want to be like, oh, her cock is her best feature. Absolutely unhinged. Aaron actually goes ahead and says that Miriam's best feature is her eyes, which I actually think is actually a really cute thing to say in dating. Aaron then says that she is a very, very, very attractive girl. I don't know what the producers were hoping on getting from this conversation. Maybe they were hoping that there would be some sort of like, oh, is she? She's got a gorgeous body all over. It feels like this is going to be like a gotcha moment. So I've had that same thought again, girls. <laughs> <laughs> it is really interesting. The fact that I've been doing this kind of like analysis, commentary content now for a couple of years, I've really been able to like, I don't know, just zone into seeing almost a little bit of like behind the scenes, behind the camera, behind the magic, into how a storyline plays out by actually thinking about what a producer is thinking of. So clearly these parts are like, so what's her best feature? They're not actually interested in them saying, I think she's got a lovely personality, a lovely this. They want them to say something that makes them almost feel like a gotcha, like you're actually gay. This is a gay dating show. She's a man, you're gay. How do you feel about that? Excuse me, I will not have that. Thank you very much, goodbye. Like that's actually the angle that I can feel like they're going towards and that feels Disgusting. We then see Miriam actually say something along the lines of they see me as a woman and they see me as a girl. It's just the fact that I've got something a little bit extra. And then she does a cheeky smile and like actually icon behavior. <laughs> but at the same time, I am like, this is uninformed consent for the guys involved. So I do feel the ick at the same time as being like props to you sis for saying that you're a girl with something extra because no one back in this day and age on TV would have ever thought about hearing someone say that and actually say that with a smile. For the longest time, trans narratives were seen on TV as like these depressing, laborious, awful, like sad, ridiculous things so there is even the trope on most like tv shows of like oh my god why is this trans woman in hospital oh the doctors have come back your hormones your hormone replacement therapy are giving you cancer and that's why you're dying no one in the history of time has ever ever met that fate absolutely ridiculous but this was a trope we saw constantly on TV shows around this time and all the way up until, well, pretty much now, actually, we still see negative trans tropes on TV, fully affecting an entire generation's opinion of trans people, which makes our collective lives in the community difficult. If you'd like to actually watch something that accurately explains people's experiences with acting, 
whether they are trans or not, on TV and how trans people are portrayed, watch Disclosure on Netflix, the documentary. It is pretty interesting to peek behind the veil at the nonsense of TV. As the competition increases, the challenges get tougher. In this Roman arena, the boys will be human chariots. So, oh my god, okay, in this next scene, the challenge, the first challenge of this episode, the first challenge of this episode is a Roman chariot challenge, because of course it is, of course it is. We've seen, what have we seen, triathlons, decathlons, run around the- Lovely woman. Naughty mummy. Swim out to sea and don't die. We have seen, <laughs> we, <laughs> we have seen, we have seen some particularly bizarre challenges. This one today is absolutely no exception to that. They are the boys have to be like the horse part of a horse and chariot and they have to race around a Roman style arena to see who's going to win the affections of Miriam and a date with Miriam today. Sure, you do use this. The budget. The budget was extortionate, wasn't it? No. So they each are assigned to these like weird little chariot looking things. It's literally kind of like a wheelbarrow. Kind of like a wheelbarrow, or like a reverse wheelbarrow, I guess, because you're actually pulling. And they have to decide who they're gonna carry on the chariot. And guess who comes back for a triumphant return? The playmates, who are clearly just on this wonderful Ibiza holiday, and that's how they've been able to get like free staying at the villa because they keep disappearing and coming back for, I don't know, Storytelling purposes, I guess. Yes. Then we have the marvelous Tanner as well, because apparently we don't have enough people to actually sit on the back of the chariots. Someone has to run Tanner around the track. If you remember, Tanner is the guy who was shouting about liars, cheats, deception, weak people. Ugh, just that wonderful man who apparently was also on um, SOS training, like SAS training. Something to do with like an army training show that I didn't see, but it was another like bizarre reality TV moment. So, great, love that. I actually got clocked for the copyright of this section so many times because they put in like, da 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 da. Is it Flight of the Valkyrie? Is that what it's called? Da 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 da. This challenge I've called Beasts of Burden. A human chariot race. Miriam actually says something pretty interesting here, and I don't exactly know what she means, but she said something along the lines of, there's actually a lot of cheating in the challenges, and the boys are very competitive because they know it's the last week. I don't know if we've seen cheating? I mean, if we have, let me know in the comments box below, because I may have, I may have forgotten. She's an old lady. I mean, look at her. She's... Old. They have to carry 75 kilos on the back of their chariot across a 400 meter race. So that is actually quite a lot. That's quite, that's quite energetic. Let's just say that. The lovely Miriam and playmates are going to be your cargo. One of you is going to have me to egg you on. <laughs> oh, lovely. Scott gets assigned Tanner just for the extra drama. And there's also like a little inference that this is somehow like a gay activity. Don't let me down, Scott. Guys. Hi, gay. And I don't understand exactly why that's here because how is carrying someone on a chariot around a race course considered homosexual activity in any way, shape or form? And if we did, we'd see it in G.A.Y. heaven constantly. So they actually have to put on little gladiator outfits, which I kind of think are quite cute. They've got these like leather cuffs on and this little like leather skirt and gladiator sandal type things. I did actually find it quite interesting here that there wasn't any random like picking in terms of like who the partner was. It was just kind of assigned. So Tom got Miriam, Tanner got, and then the playmates got Rhett and Aaron. I don't know, how do you even explain that? That feels quite rigged, actually. Rigged is the word I wanted to use. If this was fair, this would be assigned randomly, but this show is not fair, is it, girls? No. No. They put Tom and Miriam together because I truly believe they're trying to almost funnel Tom into the final and Miriam to choose Tom, I think. Miriam and Tom have had the closest date so far, I think. They had that like makeout session earlier in the week or earlier in the episodes. I can't exactly remember which one it was, but I remember it being like, night cam, night vision, look at them kissing and he's getting dangerously close, girls. We don't want him to win, so, and I think it's that kind of like Aussie Brit kind of thing as well, so. There's actually a clear division here between the Aussie guy and the British guys, and they actually mention it here in terms of like a healthy competition. Well, is it really that healthy? Scott even uses the phrase here, we don't want him to win. And this goes back to what I said earlier. It literally is a case of the new person in the competition never usually gets to the end, like 
very, very, very rarely because the people in the competition want to get them out. Great for TV, but actually very lazy storytelling. What is this sort of leather pony play is this? Okay, guys, ready for the race? Oh, like for She's real? Okay. The then there's a little section where each of the guys are talking about like how competitive they feel in this competition. Like clearly the producers have been like, so are you ready for the one of the final challenges? Are you ready? Are you gonna win? Do you wanna win? Do you want to wear mummy's wig? And there's even a little joke about like coming close as in like, oh, I'm coming close up to second place. Just Come really along, sea biscuit. One. Oh my goodness. If I was a member of nobility in ancient Rome. Ha! I must actually say also, I don't know why, but the posing on this chariot is absolutely ridiculous. They're literally like sitting like this with their legs like fully spread eagle girls. And as Tom is like paired up with Miriam, Miriam is constantly going, come on, Tom, we've got to win. Do it, Tom, run, Tom, run. We've got to win. And Tom literally says in his talking head, it was actually very annoying hearing her say this because I was just like, can you please shut up? I'm running. Or something to that effect. So, trouble in paradise already, girls? Get me the whole way around, which was really pissing me off. Oh. I was doing the best I could and it didn't help. Then we have this glorious shot of the boys running with the playmates and Tana around the corner. What is, just what is that? What is that? Have you ever seen anything so ridiculous? Welcome to the Nopimpia Chanel. Run around a Roman arena to catch the love of an attractive trans woman and the chance to suck a c Unhinged, completely unhinged. After lots of nonsense about trying to explain like, oh my goodness, I was running around the corner and I almost made it to the first line and then someone came up behind me and I couldn't make it and it was going to be a race and I was nearly going to win. Ah. All of the drama associated with something being like racing girls was fully lent into. Absolutely no breaking, no barriers here. Just fully leaning into all the stereotypes you would imagine of, let's all have a race, girls. Then the worst winning horn I have ever heard play plays. Listen to the sound of this. Those little leather skirts are kind of growing on them. What a horrible air horn that was. What was that? Listen to that. What was that? Stop it. And then all of the boys are left bent over and panting in a very precarious position, which is for some reason filmed, because of course it is. And in the end, Scott won the race by pulling Tanner the fastest across the finish line. Yay, Scott! Oh, oh kissy poos. Yeah, so as Scott won the race, according to like the rules of this show, which don't actually seem to be anything at all, it, sh would sh it really should be Miriam taking Scott out for the date on this time. But we have actually seen in previous episodes that that's not actually what happens at all and Miriam just kind of gets to decide whatever the hell she wants. She's like, no. So interestingly enough, at the very end of this race, Rhett ends up on his back, legs akimbo going, <gasps> and a paramedic has to actually come over and assess him. And apparently he's absolutely fine. And the other guys are very much of the opinion of like, look at him. Why is he trying to get attention like that? I don't know. This show is really weird. Oh my goodness. An upskirt shot in leather. Hello, who's pussy assess? Then we have this little debrief section where Miriam talks talks about how impressed she is with Scott actually winning a challenge because Tom appears to be the one that's been winning all the challenges so far. So actually Miriam here is starting to sound like she really likes Scott. So I have a feeling at this point in the episode that Scott and Tom are probably going to get to the final as that's the next episode. I sort of guess that there's going to be some shenanigans because there's still four guys left and there's only like she's only going to take one on a date. So she has to get rid of three. So Tanner actually in this section actually mentions that like, did you like his tactics out there on the track? And I am just a bit like, what tactics? What tactics? Were the tactics just ah, run away? <laughs> What was the tactics? Over the last 10 days, Scott and Miriam have enjoyed some special moments. Ten. Then at this point in the episode, we have like a little bit of a recap about Scott and Miriam's like budding relationship. We've seen them on the date. We've seen them on the paragliding. Is it paragliding? Parasailing. Parasailing date where they got dunked into the water. We see these sections replayed again as if production is trying to say, well, is she going to pick him? Do we know something you don't know, girls? And then Scott also says that he really likes her as a person. And that's where my heart kind of goes. Oh, if this was an honesty based dating show, this would have been so good. This would have this would have broken barriers. This would have really advanced. I don't know, just inclusivity. It's so sad that the production company went with cheap thrills instead of actually trying to be like 
an impactful change. At the villa, a professional body painter is helping Scott and Miriam get their creative juices flowing. So Miriam actually picked Scott as the winner of this challenge and they get to have like a mini date with each other. Now this date is a very interesting date because for some reason a body painter has decided to visit the villa and they're body painting Scott. So this is one of those things again where it's a very intimate uh, date kind of environment where there's lots of touching, lots of feely uppies, lots of like delicate close your eyes, let me do this. Very sort of that environment and that is kind of one of those things that I think is picked on purpose to increase the levels of like, oh, I'm getting affection from someone that I'm on a dating show with. I feel like it's a high adrenaline, high risk situation. And that's why these challenges are all based around physical exertion and also like highly intimate settings. Do you know what I mean? Like dancing is quite intimate. Going uh, parasailing with someone is quite intimate. Getting body, like, body paint done, like, from the abs upwards is quite an intimate experience. So with help from the body painter here, Miriam paints Scott as a tiger. A sexy tiger, girls! So the body painting section here is actually really intimate. There's lots of, like, Miriam really leaning over Scott. Lots of really close touchy feeliness, which is... As I've said a few times during this specific video, it would be actually quite like interesting to watch if there, if every party was kind of consenting here, but it's actually not, so it's hugely problematic. She changes when when you're left alone. She changes a little bit. And she's a bit more herself. I don't know about you, but I could not be in this environment because my anxiety would be at ninety nine percent. I would be like, I'm gonna die. Someone's gonna straight up punch me in the face. Any sort of game where you have to really like lie a lot, I'd be like, mm -mm, not working. Sorry, what? And then we have one of their wonderful little cutaways in this show of like, it's time for night now. We're all going to bed in the Hacienda. It's time for night. When in fact, it's not actually time for night. It's time for another scandal, girls. <gasps> So actually what's really interesting about this specific edit here is for some reason they were like, and it's gone to night time now. But then the next shot afterwards is Miriam still painting Scott in full daylight. So then we have the narrator say something like this. Scott might be showing his true colors, but Miriam is still holding back from revealing her all. Because of course, Miriam is still holding back from revealing her all. And actually Miriam ended up getting a lovely flower painted on her belly button. Oh my God, is that Graftopian? I've got a palette of that. I think we're a little bit closer now there's a bit more if you know what i mean so i think it's oh. just going quite slow with me so now we have a little talking head section from scott who says that the date went really well and he actually feels a lot closer to miriam now and again it's one of those things that when i first saw this it kind of pulled on my heart a little bit because i was just kind of like if this show was something actually that cared about the feelings of everyone involved that could have been a really beautiful tell-all moment of like a final budding relationship but it's not at all and it kind of it's really tainted and this is scott as the tiger not the most groundbreaking body paint work ever but still that's quite an intimate date idea, isn't it? So then Scott is like whispering gently to Miriam that he feels like he doesn't have to show off in order to get Miriam's attention. He just has to be himself. He's He's been always there for me and he's a really honest person. So then Scott actually says something very, very, very interesting here. I'm gonna try and put it in this video. If I can't, I'm gonna try and do a little like paraphrase of what exactly he says. We've talked about the 10,000 pound and what each of us would do with it. I, I think now that at this point, I think that is more coming into play now than actually like Miriam is. That says to me, I wonder if Scott maybe has an inkling or is listening, has listened to what people said in the first episode or something or spent some time with Miriam and thought, oh my goodness, maybe we aren't compatible and I actually really want that 10,000 pounds. So it's interesting that his tactic is almost changing a little bit to try and like woo Miriam into picking him so that he can also get 10,000 pounds. Because I kind of feel like initially the contestants were kind of thinking more about getting a date with Miriam than the 10,000 pounds. At least that's the kind of vibe that I got. I feel like the 10K is just kind of like, just in case you clock her, you'll also get this. So don't fuck up the show for us, please. We are producers and we need ratings. <gasps> Scandal. Oh, it's night time. Then we see another weird shot where it's like, and day tonight. But they've already just done a day tonight shot. So have two days gone or have one day gone and they've just played and it's night time now twice because the editing in this show has no quality control. <laughs> So after Scott and Miriam's date comes to a close, Rhett, the Australian guy, is straight in there trying to talk to Miriam and trying to like 
steal some precious moments with her so that he can, I guess, put his case across as to why he shouldn't go this week. Miriam is also fully in a bikini in the kitchen, so, you know, these boys are gonna be like, oh, oh, boobies. To help with the evening's yeah, entertainment, an assortment of women's clothes have been left in the guy's room. An assortment of women's clothes has been left in the guy's room because do you know what's happening tonight, girls? It's a drag show in the Hacienda. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> because of course it is because this show is trying to show that drag queens and trans people are one and the same when actually they aren't drag is an art form trans people are people Baby. Scott's new look is complemented by his tiger paint. But unfortunately, the way that this narrator talks about this section, it feels like I don't know, it feels very wrong to me because they're trying to infer that like men putting on women's clothing is like the butt of a joke. Everybody laugh, everyone becomes a slutty man in a wig and it's really funny. But you actually look quite horny. I'm actually shagging myself. And that's exactly what happens. As soon as the boys put on these stockings and these wigs, they get all like <laughs> And it's like, that is not what a woman is. A woman is not like, when have you ever just heard a woman going, apart from me, because I'll do it in videos with Roly, to be stupid. Have you ever heard a woman just do that on the street, just going on her way to Asda? I mean, you might have, I don't know your life. It's not an assortment of women's clothing. It's literally fabric. Like, unless you operate that piece of clothing with your genitals, how can it possibly be gendered clothing? Once again, it is just kind of trivializing the, what is the trans experience? The trans experience is putting on a wig and going, oh yeah, I'm gorgeous, I'm hot, uh. Just like bloody, what is it, Silence of the Lambs? This is not an accurate, this is not accurate, this is not what being trans is like at all. The world would be a much nicer place if masculinity allowed men to compliment other men without making it purposefully like, oh, dress as a woman, I'd shag you girls. It kind of makes the idea of like men dressing as women, men dressing as women, a really silly, funny thing to do. Like it's such a laugh, like look at you, aren't you funny? It's almost like masculinity in this context finds femininity hysterical and hilarious, when actually femininity is an incredibly divine, powerful thing to have. Why is it ridiculed? Like, why? Pull that up at the back. You actually look horny enough to shag, Scott. I must actually say, Tom has said this multiple times. I must admit, they're probably like full of alcohol as well, but Tom seems to be going around to all the boys and being like, I'd shag you girls, I'd shag you. You look quite horny, I'd shag you. I hate the word shag. And that really freaked me out because <laughs> I never told the guys I would be able to do something like that for me. So it's actually interesting here that Miriam has a little talking head that says, it actually freaked me out when they dressed as girls. I get the feeling here that Miriam would absolutely not date a drag queen. And for whatever reason that is, that's also valid. Like you don't have to find everyone attractive regardless of whatever they do. Do you know what I mean? Preferences are something that still exists, but you should absolutely, absolutely not prejudice against people because they don't fit what your perfect preference is, if you know what I mean. In the context of dating, if someone doesn't want to date me because I'm trans, instantly, I would absolutely never want to date them because being trans is a huge part of my identity. It's not my entire identity, but it is a huge part of it nevertheless. And I, why would I ever, why would you ever want to be with someone who doesn't like, like that part of you? You can't get away from it, so. Bleh. Hello, Sailor. Hello, Sailor. <laughs> Any excuse, isn't it? Any excuse? Any excuse? I do kind of hate, there is this thing in British media that trans people are the butt of a joke, like dressing up as a woman is seen as this like funny thing. If we are to put on our philosophy hats for a moment, there's always this thing where men dress up as women and then when they're told to act like a woman, they're always like, <laughs> you can fuck me. Because that's what they think that women are like. Why is it that men, when they're dressing up as women, always go to this like ridiculous, over the top bimboification? in such a negative way. Why is that? And of course with British TV, unfortunately, like dressing up as a woman has always been seen as the butt of a joke. Like there is a very famous show in the UK called Little Britain. And one of the entire scenes throughout the entire series was just, I'm a lady, in which uh, David Walliams would dress up as a Victorian woman. And the whole point of every single joke was that they were a woman. 
I don't want a sister, I want a man. <laughs> Miriam then actually says something quite amusing and says, I don't want a sister, I want a man. Again, this show is still very much a product of its time. A lot of the opinions of everyone involved in this show are not exactly the best. What do you know, Polish? Where's the foundation? I need mascara. And who's got lipstick, boots? Because as soon as you give men the opportunity to wear makeup, they become immediately the most insufferable divas you've ever met. <laughs> oh, hideous. <laughs> then they come out and they give Miriam a drag show. They all come waddling out and they all behave how they think a woman behaves. So there's all this sort of like, eh, eh. And it's like, when have you ever, when have you ever seen, when have you ever seen a woman do that? Never. Drag can be funny, but the entire concept of like dressing as a woman as the point of being funny is where I have the problem. And they do this drag show to the soundtrack of I'm coming out, because of course they are. Of course they are. You're not getting any more filet mignon? Get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Not to go. I'd probably say I was the most convincing dressed up in women's clothing. You know, I think. Uh, delusion. Yeah. Delusional delusion. Hello, good evening. Ich heiße Aubergines. Uh, you know, I put the voice on and do the, the actions and the twirls. Because that's what women do. Actions and twirls. You know, I put the voice on, I do the actions, I do the twirls. Then Miriam pushes them all into the pool and they all lose their wigs and clothing and their makeup goes everywhere because what's funnier than a man in drag? A man in messy drag in a pond, apparently. Janice is quaking. And then Tom pulls Miriam into the pool. So, you know, everybody's a wet mess now. Miriam is becoming one of the boys now and we are bonding all a lot better. <laughs> Then we have a talking head from Tom that is actually a really interesting thing that he said because he says Miriam is definitely one of the boys and it's like okay so did production ask a question like do you think Miriam's one of the guys does she act like one of the guys is she one of the guys not in terms of like is she a tomboy and involved with the guys in like I don't know like a fun capacity it's one of those leading phrases again that's like do you think Miriam's a man? And that makes me feel multiple different ways and all of them negative. <laughs> sure, okay, sure. I mean, you have only known each other for like six days at this point, but go off, sis. She's invited a veteran fortune teller to the villa. Oh, to meet Mystic the guy's Meg is here. Cards. Then, in the most bizarre twist of fate I've ever seen, a According to the narrator, Miriam has to make a difficult decision on who she wants to stay until the final. So who does she call in? A medium girls. A psychic fortune teller is coming in to advise Miriam on who she should bring into the final. <laughs> Dream Makeup Planet Neptune and Venus spin fortunes for Scorpio and Capricorn and someone who bought a ticket at 6 p.m. today. The power of the pendulum is spelling out Pat and Kathy as winning names and a woman wearing dark blue is serving drinks. A grey cat with golden eyes is close by. Insurance workers Bin men and a dentist will be celebrating too. The boys know they are being filmed, but what they don't know is Miriam will be watching on a monitor. Interestingly, in this scene, we actually see the fortune teller explain to Tom that he has been oppressed or is being oppressed. She straight out asks him, have you been oppressed? And he immediately says, no. And I made a joke here saying, of course you haven't because you're a cis straight white man. <laughs> really should hold my tongue sometimes, shouldn't I? She then immediately flips the script and says, oh no, so you haven't been the oppressor, but you've been oppressing someone before. Is that right? And he says, in the last relationship, I was dominant. What that's got to do with anything, I don't know. Is it trying to infer that now because Miriam's secretly a man, she's going to be the dominant one. You're going to be a submissive, sissy little bitch boy. Good heavens. Is that what they're trying to say through the guise of Mystic Meg? Then in a talking head by Tom, we hear him say something along the lines of, of course it would be different with Miriam. Of course my relationship would be different with Miriam because I feel like she's quite up for equality. Now, 
the producer there or the storyline teller or whoever it is that's actually interviewing him would have said do you think there's something different about Miriam would your relationship with Miriam be something different again it's this thing of like we're gonna set them up for a fall so we might as well get some great content along the way girls I think it'd be very much equal if at all maybe she might be the dominant one and I bet you the producer there was like ah oh, yes yes I love it say it again she knows what she wants and she knows how to get away and things this would have been a great answer for something that's just like sexual equality within a relationship great unfortunately it's gonna be like ah oh, she's gonna get out her c and fuck you in the ass Wow, I cannot believe I said that. <laughs> Shocking! This is a bit like commentary inception. Next up is Rhett and he meets Rachel the fortune teller and she has got something in store for him. What it's saying to me about your past in relationships is that you've been very much concerned probably with body and physical things. But I can see that there's huge concern about what you, you know, about the state of your body, what you look like and... Yeah. She's saying I'm quite shallow. The fortune teller goes on to suggest that Rhett has body image issues and that he's actually quite shallow and that he's obsessed with the way that he looks because somehow it plays a part of uh, the level of sex that he got in a previous relationship. I actually think that this is a very, very, very unacceptable thing to say to someone is to straight out be like, do you have body issues? It's all about your body image, isn't it? Yeah, it's all about your body image because all of these guys look like they're in pretty good shape. All of them seem to have been to the gym at some point in their lives. They've all got active lifestyles. They all compete in these active challenges on this show. I do feel it's quite distasteful for a medium clairvoyant psychic fortune teller to come on and say, you've got body issues, haven't you? On TV to kind of like, force that narrative upon someone. If it turns out he did have body image issues, do you think then that the producers would have just dropped it and moved on? No, if he just said, yes, actually, I have struggled with the way that I look. Oh my God, they would have loved it. They would have latched onto it. It would have been a Tyra Banks moment. It would have been just cringe. Cringe, bad, awful, unhelpful television. I'm not saying that at all. And it's not a criticism. I'm just saying what I'm saying. The fortune teller actually immediately backtracks here and says, it's not criticism. It's not, I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you're shallow. It's not criticism. That's exactly what you've said. It says. What the fuck was that? How, excuse me, Madam Psychic Megal Beggles. Why the fuck was she just like, I think you're too obsessed with your body in a way that's like not actually positive. TV was so problematic. There was absolutely no care given to any of these contestants. I'm not the biggest fan of rep judging from what I have seen on this show, but no one, no one deserves that treatment. No one deserves to have that thrown at them on TV in a place that they are unfamiliar with in a competition show because that is like, oh, that's disgusting. Oh, that's really gotten me. No. Hey, wow, I didn't like that. Oh. When I first went in and had my tarot done, I was just my I was quite surprised. It's in the present. Mm. Death. Ten of swords. You oh! Have... Are you in a relationship at the moment? No. He's no, going to see not. ten swords tonight. I'm going to cream. So Scott actually says something quite, um, quite endearing, but also a little bit like, Again, difficult to hear in the context of this show. He actually goes on to explain that he feels like he wants a relationship because he wants to feel loved and he wants to be there for someone and have someone there for him. That is a completely relatable fact for, I imagine nearly everyone watching this show would have thought, yeah, you know, that's sensible. It's nice to have a partner. It's nice to have someone on your team. It's nice to be in love and have that person love you back. Unfortunately, in the context of this show, that's not what it is because it's all based on this kind of like deception in a way. And my heart kind of goes out to Scott here. Scott, weirdly enough, has the shortest amount of time in this episode with the fortune teller. So I don't know what else is said and we don't really ever get to see what else is said. Straight away with Aaron, the fortune teller says, there's a sense of sadness with within you and Aaron basically then explains that his parents separated when he was very young and that has kind of affected the way that he can form meaningful relationships. I actually felt a little bit uncomfortable watching this because I thought that was a lot of information to give a stranger and also someone who claims to be a fortune teller. I was a bit like, well, this is going to be completely abused and used for storytelling purposes on this reality TV dating competition show. Yeah, you're not going to forget that. Well, you're still going to be with you, and you're oh, going to remember that. Slurpy. But they still don't know Miriam's true identity. I think when we get to the moment, it will just come out. Then in this section, we actually have the first talking head with Miriam that is actually 
kind of like the most recent in terms of being filmed with Miriam in this moment. So a lot of the other talking heads that Miriam has given sounds like it's filmed as it's happening, whereas this section films feels like she's saying it right at the final. So she actually says, I don't know how I'm going to reveal to these guys who I am and my journey. I don't know how, I don't know when it's gonna happen, but it'll happen right at the right time and it will just happen then. I don't want to think about it, I just want to say it. So that is the first time that we're kind of seeing this moment play out, This the first time that we're even hearing any inkling about how the final is going to go. It's quite late in the game and it just kind of goes to show that once again, the production team didn't really have a story apart from the last moment of drama, girls! Is this the first time we've talked but about it? Hopefully, everything will come back it. And I can't help but feel like she's 21 years old in this, so when I think back to my experiences as a human being at 21, I was naive as hell. And I can't help but also think that that is quite a naive thing to say, but it's very it's appropriate for a 21 year old to say. We also have to remember that most of the people on this show are early 20s, and people in their early 20s make mistakes. I feel like I've only really just started sorting out some of my early 20s, mid 20s mistakes now that I'm in my 30s. So I kind of do extend a branch of like, oh, it's okay to be naive. It's okay to be a little bit ignorant because you're still learning. You're not even a full adult at 21 yet. Like you're not fully formed. While I can sort of understand where she's coming from, looking at it, I am like, it's quite naive to just assume that everything or hopefully everything will be okay. That's not what's likely gonna happen in this situation. Randomly at this point in the show, there is another date coming up girlies. Another date, another opportunity for the four men left to impress Miriam with their skills in cooking. I don't know how to cook, so I decide you guys cook for me. So you guys gonna pick a course. Now, Aaron is a chef, so one would naturally think that Aaron is going to be like the best at this game, correct? So between the guys, they have to find out which course they would like to make and then impress Miriam with. I believe there's an aperitif, a starter, a main, and a dessert, and the guys sort of sort between themselves as to who's going to cook what. For me, it's kind of one of those things of like, I would not be proud to say that I couldn't cook because for me, it's like a very, very, very basic human function to be able to say, I, there's this thing that I like eating and I sort of know how to make it. Do you know what I mean? And while all this decision making is happening, the theme tune to Mission Impossible is playing because of course it is. Because men learning how to cook and cook a meal together is somehow Mission Impossible. Yes! Weirdly enough, the guys are actually just allowed out of the villa to go and pick up ingredients for this thing. So that is one of those things that now we just don't see in reality TV very often. We don't see like the cast members being allowed to go out into public and sort of detach from the reality TV show and go out and get ingredients and go shopping. It's actually, we actually saw this kind of a thing happen on America's Next Top Model in cycle one where they just were like popping to the local shop. It seems weird to see now because it's like, well, you could never, you could never leave the house and go shopping now. Do you know what I mean? People will be like, oh my God, they're on that famous reality TV show. Ah, exposed. And Aaron at this point, while shopping for ingredients, is kind of like, I'm going to be the best chef you've ever seen. I've got the guts to make a decent meal. I'm going to win, girls. And it kind of makes me go like, are you sure? Are you just quiet, this fighting talk? So Miriam states in this episode that she's not a huge fan of like really, really spicy food. So what do they do? What do some of the guys do? They they try and spike each other's dishes with some spice to make Miriam go, oh, I don't like that and I don't like you. You know, I didn't know that it's actually fine to tamper with people's food on TV, so I don't know, is that illegal? Is that, a fi that feels very illegal, because like imagine if she was allergic to something and someone was like, yeah, and someone didn't know or she didn't disclose that and then she had an accident. Rhett actually says something very interesting here and says, I didn't want to actually tell people about my cooking skills here before because apparently he seems to be quite a good cook. Although, he's the one that gets sabotaged because the other guys put spice in his dish. It's not really that important to know which dish they're cooking in this episode. What's more important to know is that they're trying to frame this as like, the boys need to cook for Miriam because she's a man and doesn't know how to cook. No, Lady Gaga. Die. Scott is first out with his nachos and dips. So Scott ends up presenting a dish of nachos and dips, which is the like aperitif of the evening. He didn't do any real cooking. He just sort of like poured nachos onto a plate and then had some dips on the side. So not really cooking, but Miriam doesn't care. She's like, delicious girls, my favorite. <laughs> Hi, and his top off. Very good. And he also comes out with his top off as well. So she's like, 
Hello, Pex. Mummy's got breasts. Yes, Dad. Hi. Love it to see you. Mm, love it to see you. Next up is Tom, and he has cooked the main dish, which is apparently going to be the most delicious dish ever. And in this section, weirdly enough, Tom's dish apparently has also been tampered with, and it's too spicy. Miriam says, Oh, this is very spicy. And has opted for Mexican like stuffed it. peppers yeah. full cool. of guacamole Amazing. and vegetables. Wasn't, yeah. Didn't she just have stuffed peppers with nachos? Isn't that just what she ate? Is she just going to become a stuffed pepper at the end of this? I've got a bucket of peas, sweetie. Rhett is up next and he serves seafood. Unfortunately, Rhett seems a little bit naive at this uh, or a little bit ignorant of cooking because he's kind of like pointing at her food, like really close, being like, there's some seafood here. We got some prawns. And it's, it's a bit like, I don't know, to me, if someone was like that, on my plate, I'd be like, mm, please go away. He also fumbles for ages, not sitting down, whilst trying to find a bottle opener, but he's kind of just like this. Uh, the Sit down. I had to marinate the salmon. Everything's Sit down. Marinated. What are you doing? Oh, I need a, a bottle opener. So while he's trying to find this bottle opener, on the table there is literally three bottles of open wine. So... Unnecessary. I feel like nerves kind of got the better of him here. And this is one of those things that I guess you learn the more sort of dates you go on, the more sort of comfortable you become with the idea of dating. These men are also quite young still. So it kind of does make me feel like they've got some learning to do in terms of dating skills. Don't stand over someone's dinner pointing at what you've served them and then be like, oh, I need to find this, I need to find this, and like stall the conversation, make it feel difficult, because immediately the person sitting down is going to be like, oh, I feel awkward. You're kind of just like all hovering over me and making me feel a bit like worried and anxious. At least that's how I would feel in this situation. I don't know, if there are any boys out there wanting to know some dating tips, make sure that you just have flowing conversation, a little bit of laughter, and smile, and make sure you sit down at the dinner table. Even if there's something in your pocket that you need to find, make sure it's in your hand before you sit down. And last, but by no means least, is Aaron. Aaron is serving the dessert. Now, Aaron is obviously the chef of the group, and he's really taught up his skills. He serves the dessert, and Miriam says, it's amazing, I love it. Basically, we've got a layer of sponge, strawberries and cream, finished off with a little design on the plate with some uh, strawberry coulis. Amazing. But I think he uh, <laughs> finding it difficult. What is that? What is this? So it seems that Miriam has already picked Aaron as the winner of this challenge when she actually ends up spitting out a little piece of plastic or something. And Aaron immediately like, plucks it up and goes like, oh my God, what is that? And at this point, Miriam calls everybody out of the villa kitchen to come and stand next to her at the table and goes down each of the guys explaining what was good and what was bad about their dish. Now she does actually say to Scott that all you did was put some dips next to some nachos. And to be honest, you kind of can't go wrong there, can you? That's exactly what he did, even though it is kind of like a tasty, delicious meal. Is it actually cooking? Mm -hmm. Is it? No. Aaron wins this challenge. Miriam says, you're the best, and he wins. After failing to seduce Miriam with his cooking, Tom is outside her bedroom door trying a different tactic. Now something very interesting happens because Tom didn't win the cooking challenge, but he ends up spending some time outside of her window late at night, or at least later that night, and he keeps making excuses being like, I don't know where the salt and pepper is. I don't know where this is. Oh, I'm just going to go over here and check this. And ends up going over to Miriam's window and having secret conversations with her. So once again, we're presented with this situation in which actually it's kind of cute that a guy wants to spend more time with Miriam. Miriam, I just wish there was some level of informed consent because this would have been great to show trans relationships and trans dating and being made to feel special because it's kind of like, this guy really wants to spend time with her and just go and like, talk, have secret little chats like at the window being like, I'm really sorry I didn't impress you at cooking today, but I can't stop thinking about you and you're so pretty and blah, blah. And it's just, it's really like heart wrenching because it's one of those things that's, I'm waiting. I feel like I'm on the edge. I've got that anxiety stepping in of like, oh, God, what's gonna happen? Someone's gonna clock her and punch her right in the jaw. Like, that's the feeling I get. Weirdly enough, even though Aaron won the challenge, he doesn't actually get a date with Miriam at this point. I don't know what the point of this extra challenge was, because 
Nothing happened. Scott seizes the opportunity to get to up squirt close and her. Personal. All the guys are a little bit drunk and they're trying to vie for her attention. And then Scott decides to sing a lovely song for Miriam. And it's not very lovely, but it's an excuse to get close to her and dance. And then everybody else is kind of jealous. And for some reason, there's water guns and they end up squirting Scott. So do with that information what you will. But just before bedtime, Tom ends up stealing a little bit more of Miriam's time and a little goodnight kiss at the window under the guise of, I'm just going to find something I left upstairs, everybody. I'm just going over there. Naughty slut. They have no idea that not one, but two of them will be leaving the villa today. At this point in the show, we have the huge dramatic reveal that is, in fact, tonight's episode is going to be a double eviction. Could anyone have seen that coming? Then we have a very strange situation in which Rhett says this. Remember, this is 2004, and this kind of language was very normalised. Already tensions are running high. Yes. Rhett, fuck him. I'll be, I'll be happy to see him go. <laughs> response, right? I can't wait to see you go, you fucking hippie poof <laughs> male bonding testosterone fucking dyke we're nearly eviction we got so many slurs in that sentence that i was like what what what? But then swiftly moving on from that utterly bizarre segment, we actually then have Tanner and the narrator slash host sitting at a table with four Polaroids left of the boys and Miriam goes through the points which are positive and negative for each one and then kind of leaves on a little bit of a cliffhanger before a commercial break in which then at the very end we are revealed that at elimination, it's a double eviction and she decides to go with... Knew it. Knew it. Rhett becomes the first of the double eviction uh, rejects. No, that's not the word. Becomes the first person to go from the double eviction. Reject? Oh my god. Miriam has decided that one more of you has got to go. No, the producers the did. Two. Knew it, knew it, knew it. I fucking knew it, girls. I could see it. And the next person to go in the double eviction is Aaron, which I thought was a really weird choice, even though he technically won a challenge, but didn't actually also get a date. So I don't know what production was saying there, but they were like, I don't know why I said it, production. I don't know what production was saying there, but they basically said, no, send him home. So off Aaron goes. Sorry to do that to you guys. Oh, I don't know, it's just the hardest thing ever, ever. So in the final, we have Tom versus Scott. At the very end of this episode, there is a little talking heads between them being like, did you imagine it was going to be you vying for Miriam's affection? What's your technique going to be to win Miriam's affection? Are you interested also in the 10K? And that kind of leads us right up until the very end of this episode. Finally, we are going into the final just with Scott and just with Tom and Miriam. And of course, in the final, as they have kept hinting throughout this entire episode they've kept hinting Miriam is going to reveal to them or reveal to the winner at least that she is trans after this episode I was kind of left feeling a little bit bewildered and confused just like I kind of have with every single episode we've watched so far again there is no real storyline in any of these episodes or there's no real rules to this game it just literally just seemed to be Miriam takes people on a date whoever she wants to take on a date Although what's even stranger is that the cooking challenge, there wasn't even a prize. There wasn't even like a, oh, you get to go on a date with Miriam or you get to do something, anything. It was just, oh, Miriam's picked you to win. Let's move on to eviction. I don't think I've ever seen another reality TV show that's so hodgepodge put together nonsense that has no real flow to it. It's literally all aiming for this final big reveal at the end and basically collecting the drama around that moment. So my lovelies, I would love to hear your thoughts on this episode in the comments box below. It is kind of a weird one because as I say, it's kind of have to be a recap episode. It's probably gonna be quite chopped up considering the fact that the copyright on this is not just, uh, it's not just block, it's not just like unmonetized, it's worldwide blocked, which means I cannot put this on YouTube as it is. I'm gonna have to do some really clever, wacky editing and it needed more context than just me being able to put this video on there. I am trying to find a way that will allow Patreons to watch 
this episode. I don't know if that's going to be streaming it on Twitch or somehow putting it on Vimeo or Dailymotion or even in a Google Drive account. I'm not sure. Please check the comments box below for what I actually come up with. It will be in a pinned comment. But I must say it will only be available to Patreons. So my lovelies, please let me know about what you think we have seen in today's episode. It's been an absolute mess from start to finish, shall we say. But with that, my lovelies, it is time for the Patreons. You can see yourself scrolling past on the screen right here. Because of the nature of this episode today, I will not be doing a Twitch shout out because fundamentally I don't quite know how I'm even going to edit this to get this onto my channel. But please know that I do in fact have a Twitch and you are more than welcome to go over and follow me over on that. It is Luxeria Plays and I stream two nights a week, my loves. And with that, I also want to say a massive thank you to my top tier Patreons. Aloria, Laura Ali, Luke Peterson, Stefutech, Orko Samoji, Beebles32, Camille Sara, Shell Herman, Christy Crownover, Christina Kyle, ContraPoints, Danielle, Danny Smith, Dr. A, Elizabeth Stone, Eric Castillo, Jen Martin, Jennebeth Herman, Jenny Hendricks, Laura Jane, Laura Jane again, Les Banana, Min Min TM, Moriah Sherman, Nixie Tricks, Paolo Rivero, Rachel C. C. Biscuit, Ryan Vita, Sexy Texy RN, Slampire Queen, Travafull, Tromo, and Victoria Carella. And I really want to leave it on the note of... Oh, God, <laughs> what can I leave this on the note of? All right, I'll leave it on the note of. If you're going to invite someone out to dinner or you're going to cook a meal for them, please sit down at the table and don't faff around over at them pointing at their food like this and all up in their business. It would not make me go, oh, I really like you. I love the fact that you've touched all my food and pointed at it for me. I love that. I would, it would just not happen. And with that, my loves, I will see you in the next episode. <gasps> yes.